Tony Chavarria is the Curator of Ethnology at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, Laboratory of Anthropology in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He has served as cultural exhibit cons consultant for the Miami University of Ohio, the Pauaki Pueblo, Pueblo Poe Center, the National Park Service, the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology, the Haku Museum at the Sky City Cultural Center, and the Southwest Association of Indian Arts. He has also served as a community liaison and curator for the inaugural Pueblo exhibition at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. He resides and abides at Santa Clara Pueblo. Tony Chavarria. I just wanted to thank Pamela and Sarah uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak with all of you today too. It's been a really, really uh, illuminating experience for me and to be exposed to uh, these many different things. And I hope that um, I can also you know, share little different things with you as well. So this uh, presentation is gonna be a little mix of uh, some different things uh, talking about again ethical considerations, but um, a little bit of history, you know, and art and design thrown in. So we have this really interesting um, and uh, pretty, in a sense, uh, progressive quote. Um, I don't know if any of you are political buffs and see if you can recognize, you know, who um, wrote this, but this is an excerpt from a, a letter. And as it says, but the story of the Indian in America is something more than the record of the white man's of frequent aggression, broken agreements, intermittent remorse, and prolonged failure. It is a record also of endurance, of survival, of adaptation, and creativity in the face of overwhelming obstacles. It is a record of enormous contributions to this country, to its art and culture, to its strength and spirit, to its sense of history and its sense of purpose. Later on in the same letter, um, Richard Milhouse Nixon also was advocating the return of the lands to Taos Pueblo. The first time that would ever happen it was in the federal system. So as you all know, there's been a, uh, a range of <laughs> incidents, if you will. Um, and as we talk, talked about yesterday too, you know, the millennials note this and they, they blog about this and they write about this on many different things. And, so, so again, native cultures has, has been sort of an inspiration for um, mainstream culture, you know, as long as it's been around. And, and it's um, worked to varying degrees of success and, and perceived successes and perceived failures. Um, that's enough time on that one, okay. <laughs> so, um, with... And so uh, with uh, the governor's daughter, Oklahoma governor's daughter, um, who was in the uh, headdress in the prior photo, then um, after the uh, controversy, smoothed things over by um, saying her ban was going to be in full regalia and then wearing a uh, sheep dan uh, uh, cape and then performing a mock uh, war dance at a, con a concert in Oklahoma that um, was, again, so egregious that even her mother threw her under the bus. And uh, my colleague Valerie is working on an exhibit and she's been doing more and more research on this and I'm uh, glad that um, my current project isn't, I'm not exposed to it too much because Valerie is, it seems like every other day comes with some new, um, in a sense of uh, something that just, she, she says is just really offensive or something that just seems so terrible and just the, the, the brief work I did on it too, it's like I don't think I take this, it's it just, just um, it just became just too, uh, well, like you said, you know, the heart can take only so much. So. And, and over time, you know, like, and actually, Pamela, I didn't realize it was 18 years, but, <laughs> but I guess it was something like time. And, but this image takes us back. This is, goes back to the beginning when we started the, license, the licensing program developed and some of the earliest um, products we were doing. And we were both very new at this. And this image is showing us how to 
um, kind of what to not to do things. We learned a lot from this in these initial steps. And it just looking, it's looking back over this time to see how much we've learned and hope to be able to share a little bit of that with you just you know, in one experience in one geographically specific place. And all these different elements, not even just beyond the fashion things, but there's other things that happen you know, within the broader culture that impact Native America. One of the recent ones was this, the sale, the auction of the Hopi mask, the material in Paris. Um, and then, you know, then the, the press, you know, as always, you know, goes for the juicy quotes and then getting the one where the collector adding um, that he added that he will probably not ever give them back to the Hopis as they didn't care for them in the first place and now they want them because they have a value. Again, uh, extending a value to something that has a value other than um, what its original purpose and intent was for. But to explain how, why you know, there's this you know, sense you know, either of offense or why we need to tread lightly, I need to um, uh, talk about where we, where we are right now and how we got here. And so I want to start with a story. Um, so centuries ago, um, a very long time ago, it was a time of scarcity. It was a time of troubles, a time of conflict. And there were um, uh, wars and rumors of wars. And a place up north from here where uh, people lived, they were, um, had lived there for many, many, many years, for generations. Yet the songs and, the, the, and everything else were, weren't um, uh, having the intended effect anymore. The cloud people had gone away. And th there were stories that they were, the, where the cloud people had gone, a place where there was abundant water, where you could grow crops again, where the unending drought didn't exist. So the people were, be were preparing to leave their homeland. They were preparing to leave the place that they had built their culture around, and their lives, their societies, and their families. And before they left, though, um, one person decided that they were going to create an image. They were going to create a symbol. And that would remind them of where they lived, who they were, and what they did. This is a um, place called uh, Canyonlands National Park in southern Utah. It is a place uh, where Pueblo people lived and then in the 1300s where the Pueblo exodus began, where people left and to come down to these areas where we live today in the Rio Grande, a source of year-round water um, and where the, the, the uh, floodplain planted abundant farmlands to grow things. Bringing it a few centuries forward, just re really briefly to make a quick aside to attach it to, a, attach it to present day, it was another time of scarcity, a time of depression and of wars and rumors of wars, impending wars. And at this time, there were two um, young Jewish boys who were trying to break into the publishing business. They also decided they were, they were going to create a symbol in a period of very intense isolation and sentiment in the United States. But they felt so strongly about what was happening in other parts of the world that they felt they had to do something, if, if only something that only like two little Jewish teenagers could do. So they also created a symbol. So Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, um, before Pearl Harbor, then publish uh, Captain America number one on the cover of it where he's punching out Hitler. Again, at the time when there's still you know, a degree of sympathism for for Germany or you know, strict, you know, very strong isolationist sentiment, but they felt they had to make a, a, a symbol and such. And this is what, um, again, that other previous artists did as well. They created something that has a visual meaning, of, you know, visual impact, but also has a deeper cultural meaning. And that is what um, I want to try and talk about today. So when the people came down to these areas now, to the valleys, of New Mexico, of Arizona, and to the farmlands here. They, so they established the different, you know, the pueblos, the cultures, and at the time of my first contact with Europe in 1540, as Eric mentioned yesterday, they encountered um, over a hundred, nearly a hundred Pueblo villages, and also the Athabascan groups, those are the Apache and Navajo groups, you know, who are still um, uh, semi-nomadic you know, peoples at that time. And 
so they know, they, they, when the Spanish got here, they saw these people living in these like apartment type dwellings. They were much intense agriculturalists. So the Spanish called them pueblos, their word for people or village, because these people lived in a village all year round. And so that's why today they're generally called Pueblo Indians. And today there are uh, 19 in New Mexico, the Hopi villages in Arizona, and Isleta del Sur in Texas. And as Eric mentioned, all of these, you know, there are, there are Pueblo Indians and there are not Pueblo Indians because each Pueblo is a distinct village and has its own distinct government and relationship with the United States and the subsequent states that they reside in. In 1598, after those initial explorations, the colonization of New Mexico began. The Spanish introduced um, uh, new things such as uh, you know, metals. And actually, um, the place where I'm from, where they speak the Tewa language, um, the word for Spanish, basically people, tra roughly translates to metal people because of that, the material that they brought. Um, and then they also dropped, introduced the large draft animals, um, you know, cows, sheep, um, which have become uh, very important to uh, the uh, uh, the, the Navajo, but it also, um, and that even back in 1540, and that was initial explorations, they lost uh, horses and such. And again, the horses, which would become very important to the Plains cultures. Um, well, another thing that the Spanish brought, though, um, was also their system of government and their, uh, their ch the church. So that actually, when they came up here looking for gold and silver and really not finding anything, what they did find was people. And so they felt that there were these souls, these souls that had to be saved and converted. So, you know, in, in those days, you know, you really didn't have a, a choice. You know, you were, uh, you were converted and uh, for, that's the, why I have a Basque last name, you know, and uh, even though I'm not Basque and I uh, haven't had been fortunate to ever been to Spain, but, uh, but so then, you know, the families were grouped together, given them, uh, either priest names or a sponsor name and then, um, uh, then you know, baptized, converted. And then at that time under colonization, the Pueblos, again, as, as Eric mentioned, the, the Spanish you know, first took all their blankets. Um, they established the first capital up north of Santa Fe and then ordered uh, 400 Tewa men to dig a ditch because they had to start growing things. And then uh, eventually, as they established the vineyards and the church, uh, they would have to they had forced labor in, inside the vineyards and also to do the, the tribute through their crops and such. And at the same time, you know, oppressing the native religion very, very strongly. At the same time, there would be conflicts within the Spanish government between the, the secular officials and the church, and then with the Pueblo people in between and used for cross purposes in those power struggles. So this led to a great deal of um, uh, frustration and uh, at the time uh, in the 1600s where a lot of the uh, Pueblo leaders of the, who were still practicing the religion would be arrested, some, some were uh, whipped uh, a couple were hung. And one of the people who was whipped and let go was a man called uh, Pope. Um, he was from uh, was, uh, Okeawinge Pueblo. It's uh, about 35 miles north of here. And he uh, was an exile uh, further north of Taos Pueblo. And he started um, uh, planning with other leaders a rebellion. And so in 1680, this rebellion came to a head which is known as the, uh, again, as the first American Revolution in 1680, the Pueblo Revolt. This is an image of a painting that we have in the collections by the Hopi artist Fred Cabote showing the revolt at Hopi. And this the revolt is the, uh, the largest successful rebellion in what is now the United States. You know, and as I stress successful, they were able to expel the Spanish after the siege of Santa Fe um, in 1680. And what I looked about, what I really love about this painting is the, like some of the context that it shows. Uh, one, you know, uh, the priest is you know is being martyred, um, the uh, but one of the uh, elders, the religious officials on the right there, he's um, he's directing the men to uh, save the vigas. Um, generally, the pueblos, you know, were, they were, it was forced labor. They had to. And at Acoma, the story is when they went to Mount Taylor, um, many many miles away to get the the vigas, such as the large support beams for the church, the roof beams, they weren't allowed to touch the ground. They basically had to have groups of men carrying them all the way back to the village. And so it was a very, you know, it was a lot of work to get those done and a lot of suffering and toil. And so 
you know, they're going to burn the church, but save the vegas because we can use those again later. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's again, so it's something that when you see this, you you know, especially when you're raised with the stories in the villages, that you you know that would happen, and it's really neat that um, uh, Kabodi depicted that here. Also, one thing too is that one of the guys is taking out one of the santos in the uh, front to the front of the church, and even during the reconquest, which started in 1692, when they noted also a an account at Zuni, they went into a room where they had saved all the little santos, the saint, the carvings, and in there, and are the, even the, the, the tabletas in there, and um, when they were asked why they, why they saved them, they, were just, um, they just responded with a shrug. So, so they, they had some meaning, but there's something that they weren't, you know, didn't feel like talking about. So the, the revolt lives large in this area, you know, in the Pueblo history. This is a one of the depictions of Pope in uh, this book, Indian Leader Standing in the Path of Manifest Destiny. Um, he, he is wearing uh, one of the, uh, looks like the rabbit skin robes, uh, perhaps. And then you can see the striped um, garment he's also wearing and the yucca sandals. And of the, even the contemporary artists in the, the Pueblos are still using uh, Pope as a source of inspiration along with being raised you know, in pop culture. So, so looking at these pieces that we have here and, it, and working with the licensing program, it's taking us some time to realize you know, what we can do and where um, we should start the process of looking at things. Where what we've done um, so far is right away is we've established a base of area to look at as one no direct reproductions, but also looking at pieces where we would not um, ever really consider. And some things are like these. With these, these um, this is a manta, a woman's manta. You can see, as I mentioned yesterday, our collections you know have that ethnographic use, the community use, the cultural use. So you can see the paint. Um, you know, from her uh, arm, you know, and the, the sweat, you know, still left on the dress. The, usually the Pueblo dresses are in one piece and they're pinned over one shoulder, um, you know, wrapped around and pinned over one shoulder and then with a belt. Um, so this one is this white mantra, this incredible embroidery design. And this is another type. And so even in the museum, we have to realize, you know, that these things have a, a, a life other than just their, their visual appeal. And so often in museums, you know, we, we exhibit them this way, you know, flattened out um, to, to look at the, the whole piece. Um, and we have to remember that the things are actually used in, in communities like this and how they're stored. Um, and that's something at this museum that we've been trying to do for as long as, we, you know, the museum is, is open. The, uh, and then also realizing that the artists themselves um, are take inspiration from other places. We saw the Jason Garcia Pope piece but also in this piece too, of an unknown Zuni artist from the 1930s, who probably um, was uh, looking at uh, the, the mass media that could go to a very remote place like Zuni Pueblo in the 30s, which would be newspapers. And then even if they weren't literate in English, but the parts of the papers that they could read in a sense and understand, which would be the comic strips. Um, and they, they would uh, know that again, this visual language reduced you know, to black and white. That is the same thing that they've been doing on, within their houses on pottery, on hides you know, for centuries, of reducing images to its basic forms and storytelling through pictures. And then seeing how they depict people, um, I'm probably getting a kick out of the X's for the eyes and then doing that on their own pieces. It's in the 30s where this first starts showing up. So you'll see birds and, you know, and cranes and such on Pueblo pottery, um, but usually never with an X in the eyes. This piece on the left there by Martha Arcaro, she is a cochiti potter. Um, she does uh, pottery and mostly f uh, figurines, the figurative, tradition at Cochiti is very, very long lived and she comes from a family of potters. Martha is probably in her late 60s now and uh, she didn't know Spider-Man from, um, 
I don't know, monkey man, but, uh, <laughs> but her grandson did. And her grandson told her, um, make a Spider-Man, because Martha usually made the storytellers, mermaids and such, the, the, the traditional forms at Kochi. And so she looked at a picture and she said, oh, I can do that. And so she made a Spider-Man. But what she also did, and you know, without any like, in a sense, almost like a really specific intent, but it's just something that seemed so natural to her, is that she Indianized it. She added again this like the sash belt, and the pouch, and he's also wearing like one of the necklaces that sometimes you'll see the men wear. And I, so I just I just was just so taken by this piece uh, when I saw it when I was walking by her table at Indian Market. And then when we uh, added it in the, uh, one of our exhibitions, the shop actually um, asked Martha to make some more figurines. So she made some more Spider-Man, and I think one of her kids told her, oh, make him like he's shooting his web. So like when Spider-Man shoots his web, it's like this way. Um, but Martha, again, just saw the picture, so, but she made him, he's going like this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know if he's either doing like hook em horns or he's like saying I love you, whatever, too, in Simon. <laughs> Either way, it's kind of nice. Um, or he's a metal, but, uh, <laughs> but, and then she also was uh, made this, she said, oh, they want me to make two of them. So I said, what about Wonder Woman? And she says, well, what does she look like? And I printed out a picture of her. And she says, oh, okay, I can do that one. She says, the other one looks too hard because she was in an action pose. But this other one I printed of her, like Wonder Woman just standing there waving, holding her lasso. And she said, Martha, oh, I can make that. So she made some of those too. So again, so it was, it was really neat to get into that. She was able to uh, have this expression, work with the shop, you know, she, she got, uh, was, uh, so it was in a really nice partnership in that way. You know, it was, it was a non-licensing partnership. But again, just also just to show again that these, you know, the people, are, again, we're not all working in a vacuum, that we're all exposed to these things continuously, but it's just a matter of how, you know, how we're using them. And this goes back to, we have these uh, items in our collections that were uh, fabrics that were developed. These are, I believe, were in the late 40s. Uh, again, uh, using uh, some of the uh, elements of Pueblo design for these fabrics. And then going back to the early part of the century, it's even uh, it's a century now with the Armory Show in New York where Navajo textiles were first displayed you know, as, as modern art. You saw um, again, some of these similar pieces yesterday when you were in the collections. And, um, and Kathy you know, showed again how these pieces um, you know, are usually depicted, you know, as flat, but when the weaver designed them, you know, on a two-dimensional uh, loom, you know, but she's thinking 3D of how these designs will connect and touch each other. So this other one, too, like how we're, we have it oriented this way, but its wearing would be in the other direction with that one band going down the back. And just another example of those uh, classic phases of the chief, what's called, you know, the, the chief's blankets in the, the museum. And so a common question that's uh, often asked of, of many uh, Native artists is what do the designs mean? Um, so a lot of uh, books and guides you know, will offer up you know, multitudes of interpretations. And, but um, I really, when I've done it, I really kind of shy away from that. If there's anything that I've learned um, by observing um, uh, Native artists and bringing around the material is that the symbols incorporated um, into the designs have multiple layers of meaning. Choosing one interpretation, you know, risks giving a short shrift to the complexity of the art and the culture. Um, when asked about the meaning, um, the artist um, often gives the most literal interpretation. It's a loose, basic meaning that's most easily understood by both people. And it's not to be disingenuous either, it's just the artist's way of giving information on a mutually understandable level. Um, so designs, but they, they can be layered um, with meaning in terms of placement and sequence. In another instance, sometimes um, on the same vessel, symbols are combined to have a multivocal meaning to a society, to a family, or to just the individual potter um, or painter. There are instances where a potter has a very, very specific meaning in mind when a design is painted and is happy to share with anyone interested you know, what that means. Um, the pottery we were looking at yesterday, some of them were by the Santa Domingo um, potter, Robert Tenorio. He's painted designs that tell these wonderful, vivid stories and designs that are, that are um, combinations of symbols from other communities where the message and is his appreciation of the talents of his ancestors. 
Certain designs are sometimes identified of certain uh, tribes. Though this uh, sense of possession can be a response to market forces, it also comes from the artist's teachers. Design styles or elements, are, they can be learned and repeated and as it, until a novice becomes a teacher and the cycle repeats itself. Some designs are shared, are borrowed, and there's a significant uh, number of uh, the pots in the museum's collections where a specific Pueblo or, or, or uh, origin is being debated due to the similarity of the oddness of a design that doesn't speak to our ex, you know, established notion of a certain village style. So the polychromes that we're looking at yesterday can be really tricky uh, to the museum uh, cataloger because of trying to determine where these things are from. And also, again, even in the past, people intermarried. They were raised in one village, would marry to another, and carry the traditions from their village, which would merge with the, the, where they married into. So then bringing new designs, new techniques that would shift again and change. So designs can be inspired by older pots seen in museums or stores. And they can come to mind in the middle of the night. When we were working on an exhibition a few years ago, um, we had an artist tell us that she would wake up at night and then have a design that appeared to her in a dream and then start um, uh, sketching it on her pad before she could go back to sleep. So this is an example of a piece that uh, inspired by the an older type of pottery, uh, what's called Tularosa, black on white. So then this artist created, Diego Romero from Coche de Pueblo created a Tula Rosa, black on gold. And uh, some of you who were at the, in the tours yesterday, um, I showed uh, one group the uh, pot that had the basket impressions on the bottom. Again, early pottery using the basket as the, the, the base. And this one also has the basket impression that you can kind of see that texture in the bottom there. So, let's see. So I just want to talk about some of this, again, this going back to adaptation. The, um, so, so the, again, the response you know, the, to the Spanish oppression was you know, first the revolt, and then after the reconquest, there was the, uh, the, the greater tolerance by the Spanish for the people to keep their religion. And it's become very, very important today. And so and this adaption to the Spanish oppression, again, was to t make the religion very, very private to take things underground, if you will, to do things very close, especially in the villages here along the Rio Grande where the Spanish presence was continuous. So, what, uh, so th this is a very successful adaptation as well, so people continue to do this. And that's why when things are seen out in the open, it can be shocking to native people. And this, so that's something that you know, I would want to stress and have people keep in mind, that this is what, uh, it still happens today. Um, so you, as you can see, so there's a long period of contact with a colonial power be, long before the American period begins um, in the middle 1800s. And then you have these, these other um, issues such as the uh, uh, Dawes Act in the late 1800s, the uh, Pueblo Lands Reorganization Act and in the 1920s, the termination policy of, started in the 1940s and 50s, so, um, so that ominous name is actually what it meant was that if they were basically encouraging Native people to leave reservations. They would be schooled and trained to get jobs in cities and other towns, and eventually they would raise their families there, and everyone would leave the reservation, and then the United States would be done with the, quote, Indian problem. That's even addressed in also in uh, Nixon's letter. Um, but of course, that didn't work. And then going into jumping forward in the 1990s with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act really helps establish to where we are right now. This gave museums um, political standing and on a mutual level with museums, universities, academics. And this is kind of, it was um, this newly found um, uh, footing is still what we do, we're working with today, when, even in the licensing program. So, and so I'm going to stress is that it's, it's, this is a result of centuries of people trying to claim and reclaim you know, their heritage and culture. So this, again, this is the sense of this um, protection of, the, of a material. 
I just wanted to quickly show some pieces that uh, where we we would not do. Family wanted me to show some uh, things that uh, things that we would probably would never we would never consider. Uh, you know, using in a licensing project, unless it was something very, very specific, very, very case specific. Um, so you can see here, there's, you know, really interesting design, but um, when you look at it closer, this is depicting, uh, you know, a Kachina figure on a, a Hopi coiled basket, a tray. Paintings that oh, we have the, the named artists for, you know, unless we were doing, a, you know, a direct production like on a cards or uh, something like that to celebrate the, you know, the, the work and the artist, but not to uh, take motifs from. Um, a material that's usually used in the uh, in dances and ceremonies, like this men's kilt, which can also be used by women as an upper garment as well. A uh, yay weaving. Um, I, didn't, I just couldn't bring myself to show the one that was in the, the fashion week on that dress. <laughs> so. Another painting, this one is a stylized representation of the large sculpture on the plaza of the, the Apache among Khan dancer. Another yay weaving, this one showing the, uh, the corn uh, stalk in the middle there. Oh, this one I just really like. <laughs> this, one's, this one's huge too. What is it, like six by eight, Valerie? <laughs> it's massive, but yeah, depicting the, the landing on the moon. So, so what I'm hoping is that we can go from something like this of where a native people have been depicted and shown or treated in the broader culture. Um, because you can see here, this is a little quasi Ripley's Believe It or Not thing. American cannibals. At the time Columbus discovered America, most American Indians were cannibals! Exclamation point. Um, and not only that, but they were really badly drawn. So, <laughs> I mean, look at that hatching. Uh, but um, so that going from something like that to here, um, the Paul Frank thing, you know, they had that, they were doing that party and they had the, uh, was it, is it Julius the monkey? With his, he was in, they were having those weird headdresses and uh, these little stereotypical like things and tomahawks. And then when, he, when they discovered, found out what the reaction to that was, was then going back and not just, you know, not, re not retreating into, you know, a PR, you know, firm or something like that, or you know, quasi apology, um, but actually then realizing you know, what to do is then going back and engaging native artists, working with native artists, and creating something that you know, you know, was was meaningful and fun at the same time, and that's um, really what I hope to uh, stress to all of you is that these things can be done. We're we're still treading you know our own way through this path of licensing, working with pieces and determining what's appropriate and what's not. And just through the, uh, the efforts of all of our uh, partners and the foundation, uh, the staff, our Indian advisory panel made up of different commu community members like Ulysses Reed who's here today, they're providing this information. It's, it's great because a lot of these people are artists themselves. They know the importance, one, two, of finding a market, one, of making a living, but also of doing it um, respectfully and appropriately, especially to these artists too, to live in these long-standing communities. And one thing that I should note out, point out too, is one thing I didn't, in the, the little brief history thing I talked about, something I didn't talk about is that idea of removal. That that didn't happen under the Spanish colonial experience as in other places in the country. Later it did under the Americans when Navajo people and Apache people were forced and left, moved from their homelands and took into Bosque Redondo during the long walk. But among the Pueblos and such too, that no, they, people still have these incredible long-lived connections you know, that go back as far as you want to take them back. And that is why there's this sense of permanence and, um, and this, long, this ancient and still vibrant cultures that are still here today. And I just, you know, just can't say that enough and I, that's why I really want to, uh, to uh, let you know, you know, that is the why this feeling comes from, and that's what we have. To, we work with all all the time. We start a project, and uh, like I said, and we're just still learning and finding our way. And I hope uh, that uh, if you have uh, ideas, issues, one or two, that you can also see what we've done and what we've uh, hopefully learned, and what we can share with you. But thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have some questions of Tony? 
All righty. Oh, questions, they're happening. Hi, Jana. Thank you, Tony. Um, a quick question, and this may be naive, so I apologize in advance, but um, where I come from, there's kind of a, um, there's a sensitivity between using the words Native Americans and Indians. Oh, yeah. Will you talk about that? Sure thing. No, um, actually, I was, in some of the blogs I was looking at, too, that same thing came up. Um, and even here, once, uh, you'll see probably remember this, the, we were talking about changing the name of the uh, museum or the Indian Advisory Panel. And what I, all I can say is that in this region, people still generally use, in a sense, maybe even prefer American Indian. Native American, you know, kind of came in, you know, during the you know, civil rights movement and such, and the activism period in the 70s. Um, but however, for like some of the traditional communities, there's sometimes there was kind of like a push back on that, um, where uh, they saw that as like other people trying to find an identity, you know, creating that in a sense. So, but so people still hold on to um, uh, Indian, and just because also when it's just been here so long, um, there, some people you know again they're, they're Indians because he, he thought he was in the, the Indies, Columbus thought he was in the Indies. Other people say no. It's be, um, another uh, explanation for the name is because of the they thought. The explorers called them, thought they were in Dio. They were in God, in a sense. They were in a, sense, in a state of uh, grace, in a sense. So they were in Dio. Um, so I think some people like that, especially people who are both Catholic and very traditional. Like my mother, my grandmother. My grandmother, uh, once my cousin was wearing um, these very, uh, these biker shorts. These are like um, early 90s biker shorts, which were much more modest. You know, they came down to mid thigh and whatnot, too. And she was wearing those, and my grandmother told her, she says, what are you doing? She says, go change your clothes. She says, if you wear those, you're going to make the saints cry. And, uh, <laughs> and at the same time, she was one of the religious leaders, you know, and one of the society leaders back at the village. So she was an ardent Catholic and also the, believed at the same time in the, the native religion. And so a lot of people don't see a conflict in that as well because both religions, again, this is why this is that adaptation to Catholicism was a little, took a little better than to other, other um, uh, br um, uh, strains of you know, Christianity. Strong mother figure, you know, Mother Earth and whatnot, crow mother, um, and then the, all these other helpers, you know, whether they're supernaturals, you know, what some might call kachinas, but also the saints, that they're kind of, when they're the same, oh yeah, that, that's kind of the same thing. So, so it's, it's been long lived and whatnot too, and so that Indian here too, that's why even the Santa Fe Indian School still kept their name. And then that same debate, even in the opening of the National Museum, you know, so that there's that same debate, oh, it's not Indian, but then they basically went for consensus and the consensus was still for, you know, the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, but, but in different parts of the country, I do know that that is still debated and largely, in the, and I noticed in the mainstream press goes to um, Native American. Usually when I write text, even for papers or in exhibits, I use both. That you were talking, with the last slides, you were talking about bad adaptions and good adaptions. This last one was a good adaption. Yes, Could yes, you go back and say what the, what the difference between bad and good? Oh, so actually those, those first ones we're looking at, the ones that were from the recent uh, Fashion Week and whatnot too, where they went and they said that they were, uh, you know, they were using the, Native uh, culture is inspiration to create something original and new, but oftentimes they would just change the color, which the colors are very specific to those, sometimes those designs, and then just making something very, you know, um, shocking and I guess and it's inoffensive to some people to, to those pieces. Um, so that's an example of that because it's not understanding the culture, you know, what you're coming from. It's like just when we talked about understanding techniques understanding you know, the, the way things are made because of how you can be able to get the, the things finished. And uh, this is the same thing when you're doing something that's inspired from another culture, especially like in an, um, a long lived indigenous culture, is to understand what those things mean and trying to you know, educate and learn about it and talk, and talk to people too as well um, and finding out you know, what is appropriate and what may not be. Um, Yeah. 
Oh, well. <laughs> Let's see. Well, no, that one's not good. Yeah. <laughs> but, but those earlier ones, yeah. Um, yeah. This one's not. That one's not. Yeah, we would not use. Yeah, we would not use those. Um, let's go back to the good one. But anyway, um, there's then also at the same time there was a, one of the other designers was testifying for Congress and to try to get copyright protection, you know, for for fashion designs. But at the same time, he's talking about using native designs for that. So what that is, in a sense, what native uh, people are saying is what you're saying is then is that that designer's work is worthy of protection but the stuff that he's getting inspiration for is not, you know, that it's still, that's basically just fodder for his creativity, in a sense. So it's just something that can, we're trying to be aware of. Okay, we've got a lot of questions. I think this will be fast. Would it be fair to say that an appropriate use is a, a use that involves and results from consultation? Yes, yes, so, so it's a very important consultation. Um, cons consultation and collaboration, that's again, something that, again, is. I imagine we're, we still have to remind ourselves, even what we've done here at the museum, is to continue that. Sometimes you know, we get complacent and we think, oh, we've done this before, we don't have to do it again, and then it'll turn around and bite you. And because you know, also sometimes some feelings and attitudes will change. Something that was appropriate um, at one time wouldn't be at another. Or in the past, you know, it was a little more questionable, but then talking about it and doing something very specific with it whether it's for an exhibition or a program or a publication, you know, then it might be appropriate. But again, it all comes through with collaboration and consultation. So my question goes to that. So how do you control that? Do you have an advisory committee? How do you, I mean, it's going on all the time, you know, and how do you, when you see it, do you then do you have a plan of action or how does, how do you, do you have, how do you do this? Okay, sure. So with the licensing program, Pamela works with a, the, a group of uh, staff here at the museum of, uh, well, so it's a committee composed of staff members and people from the uh, Indian Advisory Panel that we, we, we work with that and we start talking about, you know, what's the idea, um, what's going to happen and what would be a, maybe appropriate, you know, if we even went through to create a, um, a like his design kind of sense catalog in a sense of ideas, and we spent like how many hours that day going through and just going through it first, so we create a base of what we can use and then other things to immediately just knock out. So like this, you know, um, this would be not even considered. So my question goes to you because I, I know that you served on that Poe Museum mm -hmm. and it took you six years of varying committee members from all the different um, um, Pueblos across the Rio Grande. And it took you six years to s decide on one um, museum exhi exhibit. And it was several different um, representatives. Roxanne Swensel was sharing that with me. So how does this museum organization and your committee speak for all of the people? Ah, so that's, we're trying to remember that we don't, you know, that everything that we do is one kind of sense portrait in time and that, that, that it can change. What we try to do is like work with consensus, um, at, you know, for the different activities and projects that we do. Um, I mean, Gosh, you know, we've, we've had our own internal debates, um, sometimes heated within uh, advisory panel meetings, staff meetings on what, um, you know, is appropriate to do. Like when we were working on the licensing program, you know, there are some staff members who feel that any type of imagery isn't acceptable. And then others of us, you know, are trying to find out, you know, what way that it is. Um, so, in a sense, because the same thing with even with, with uh, NMAI is that it doesn't speak, you know, it, it, you know, it's a museum of the American Indian, but it doesn't represent everyone. I mean, that was the, the really strong criticism when it first opened, that oh, there's only a few tribes that were actually were represented in exhibitions. And, but it's just something that's so hard to do, because what now, there's 560 something um, federally recognized tribes, and then you could add easily probably another 100, 150 um, that are not, but that have a claim to it. And there are others that are only state recognized. Um, so it's something that, you know, that again, it's a, you, you need to tread lightly and, and do the best that you can. And with, with everything, like when they talk about when you're growing up, doing everything with a good heart. 
And that's what you know, we, we're trying to do here. We try to remind ourselves and not get caught up you know, in the stressful day-to-day -day minutia. And that, there are, that our overall goal is something that we're trying to do with a good heart. And I'm just really fortunate right now that we have this incredible staff that I work with that but we're trying to do that. Okay, we'll take one more question. Okay. Tony, is there some kind of a monitoring, or I don't want to use the word watchdog, but maybe that's the right word, um, organization that keeps track of the flood of every season fashion and home decor, that, you know, to, to try and catch the things that you're... The, the millennials that we talked about, too, those, that, that, mass, that faceless mass out there of uh, young twerps. But, uh, <laughs> no, I keyed, I keyed. Um, <laughs> A kid because I love, but whatever. Um, no, but yeah, no, it, what, just looking at the information and then what, what Valerie's saying too, it's, it's the blogosphere. That there, there's not one mass you know, group, there's some that are strictly devoted to that, like it's called, one is the Native Appropriation, uh, by this one uh, PhD run out from back east. So I know she's the one who has a big problem with American Indian, you know, but like here, like would, would just wouldn't go anywhere. But, uh, like Native Appropriation is a big blog. Um, sometimes uh, Jessica Metcalf of uh, Beyond Buckskin, you know, she addresses the same thing as well. Um, and so then, like I said, but you know, once something, you know, they'll, get, they'll, they'll see it, they'll put it on Twitter and then it just explodes. And then, uh, so, but like with two, like with uh, Phelan, the, I can't remember, what, Christina Phelan, with when, she, when her headdress, brouhaha, she like smoothed things over by putting, insta um, instigating uh, uh, and putting a, uh, controversial statements on her Facebook, so things like that. So that it just it spreads like that within the blogosphere. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.